Good morning, everyone. Please tell the person beside you, it's so good to see you today. And we're always grateful just for us to be able to gather together and just uh, be in the house of the Lord. As we always say, um, the church is not a place that you go to, but it's a people that you belong to. And it's not an accident why you're here. Tell the person beside you, you're not an accident. <laughs> okay? But it's God who really brought you here. And just before we get into the word and before I introduce our, um, the one who'll be preaching this morning, um, the video that we've watched earlier, Every Nation Campus, that is our campus ministry. As a church, we value the next generation. We are passionate about the next generation. We put premium in the next generation. So uh, that's why we, we, we are, as a church, we go to the campuses. We have our campus missionaries. Palakpahan po natin mga campus missionaries natin. Um, and our heart really is to be able to reach out to more students, disciple them, and launch them towards God's purposes. So can we just take this time to, re- to, to pray for our campus ministry and to pray for also the students here. If you're a student, can you quickly raise up your hand? All right, there you go. So we have lots of students here. Let's just pray for the students and also for our campus ministry. Lord, thank you for Every Nation Campus. Thank you because you have a great plan. You have a powerful purpose. Lord, for each one of us, at the same time as a church, we long to see the next generation live out their purposes, God, your plans, your will for them. I pray, Lord, that um, they won't um, be swayed to the left or to the right, but they will hold on, Lord, to your promises, to who you are. And I pray that they will take on the identity that you have given them. Bless the next generation. Even pray that you bless our campus missionaries, bless our campus ministry. We are excited, God, to see the next generation. Lord, uh, live out for the very call that you have for them. And as a church, I pray that even for the different generations represented in this church, that we will all together make disciples and reach out, not just, God, to our own generation, but to the next generation and to the future generations. I pray that that we will be aligned, God, to your call for us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Which leads me, after the, our service, students, we have our Sundays, our Sundays, so uh, there's food, fun, fellowship, so right after our service, we want to invite the students, do go to the training room. Uh, it's going to be a great time together, and of course, free food. How many of you love food? Yeah. Great. Anyway, um, I find it funny, because the one who will be preaching today, as actually shown in the video earlier, but I just want to take this time to just really honor and appreciate this man. Pastor Richie, uh, together with his wife, Ateraya, they're our ninong and ninang in our wedding, ni Odi. They're um, one of the couples that we truly trust. And every time we go to Manila, ni Odi, we take the time to go visit them and hear from them and be encouraged by their stories. Um, Pastor Richie uh, was our senior pastor in Victory Zamboanga. He went there as a singer and eventually brought Ateraya there when they got married. And um, they pastored a church in Victory Zamboanga for 18 years. Then after that, 18 years in Zamboanga, then they pastored our church in Victory Cagayan de Oro for two years where uh, great things were about to happen. <laughs> now we had plans of as ni Odi moving to Cagayan de Oro and us serving alongside them as Pastor Richie was overseeing the whole of Mindanao and we would move there and help out uh, leading the campus ministry. But God had greater plans. And now, uh, after the two years in, in Cagayan de Oro, they are now pastoring our church in Victory Taft. And it's a very thriving church. It's a growing church. They're reaching out to campuses there. And it's always an encouragement just to hear their stories um, Pastor Richie and Ataraya, they were our speakers in our just concluded na couples retreat. How among you joined that couples retreat? Sino dito, by next year you want to join that couples retreat? Oh, how among you, you're single, you want to be single forever? I don't know. But anyway, we had, we had a blast and we are thankful for their stories and how they really imparted so much to us. And... Uh, There are so many things that they're doing together, but one of the things that they are passionate about is raising up their own next generation. They have one lovely daughter, Siranya, who's actually now in Kids Church. And din ako padugayon pa. Victory Davao, let's all welcome Pastor Richie. Yan to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pastor Jopet. May muntag sa inyong tanan. So glad to be here. 
uh, good thing that I wasn't wearing the same shirt and jacket <laughs> as the one I wore in the video, which actually I was wearing when we flew here <laughs> last Thursday. <laughs> but uh, really glad to be here. It's a great joy to be back. Last time we were here was 2018. Okay, so that was pre-pandemic. And uh, just seeing the city and uh, the church here and the leaders, we are so blessed to see what God is doing here. And I just want to let you know, you are so blessed to have Pastor Jopet and Audi as your pastors and your leaders. They're one of the finest leaders in our movement, all right? And uh, one of our greatest what if is uh, what could have happened if we worked together. So, uh, so happy to see the church where, uh, where it is right now because of their leadership and all the pastors who are here. And of course, all the leaders. Again, uh, thank you so much for what you do for the Lord. And also great to see some friends like Jok Jok and Daryl, who's also from Taft, and see si, si Emerson and see si Joy, okay, from uh, Sambuanga pa, way back. And now they're now based in, in uh, Davao. So, so glad to see all of you. And uh, so excited to minister the word again. Thank you, Pastor Jopet, for the opportunity to share with you all today. And um, okay, we are on the second to the last part of our series, The Road Out. I would like to invite everyone to please stand in respect of the reading of God's word. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. And I would like for you to read out loud with me, verse 12, all the way to verse 14. And then we'll have a word of prayer. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12 to 14. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And then verse 14, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we ask that as we continue with this series today, we pray, God, that you would lead us out of anything that keeps us in bondage. I pray, God, that you would guide us through life with courage whenever we face challenges, Lord, with fairness and justice when we are privileged. And we ask, God, that you would pour out your grace upon us as we follow you through the road of enjoying true and lasting freedom. And as we help others experience the same. This we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen. Amen. You may all take your seats. As you may very well be aware by now, this series is actually about um, slavery. It's uh, about not just slavery, but it's about experiencing true and lasting freedom. This also covers a story that is very much about oppression and injustice. But the series speaks of how God is also restoring justice and peace for his people. And if you can recall in the previous weeks, and especially more so today, that this series is really about idolatry and how serious the worship of false gods is to the Lord and how we should be worshiping the one true God. You know, the title, The Road Out, is actually taken from the word exodus, which means the road out. And that's pretty much what the book is all about, the road out of slavery. But I like the Hebrew name for this book. Uh, it's actually Shemot. Okay? And um, that actually means the book of names. That's why if you look at the first part of Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, it speaks of the names who came to Egypt. And then all throughout the book, you will find many names that we will look into in a short while. 
And I think it's important to understand why idolatry needs to be addressed, not just for the time in Egypt, because they have many gods, but if you really worship the wrong gods, we don't realize this. It actually enslaves us. It actually keeps us in bondage. And we are shaped and formed into the wrong image of the God that we worship. And if we are not careful, we might end up just like what these false gods are going to end up in. And that is judgment from the one true God. Now, I know uh, many of us will probably say today that uh, I'm a Christian already. I don't worship false gods anymore. I don't have idols in my home anymore. But who among you can relate with this? So sometimes we can be Christian. We trust God. We trust Jesus for our salvation. But when it comes to other things, we trust in false gods, small g. Diba? Uh, Christian ako, I believe in God, pero I want to know my future. So we go to our horoscopes. Huwag kayong maniwala sa horoscope. Okay, horror ang kalalabasan nun. Sometimes we think, eh, there's nothing wrong with this. Okay lang naman eh. Kasi syempre, gusto lang natin mag- maging swerte. Diba? That's why we have frogs with coins, hip-hop cats. Huwag kayong maniwala sa swerte, malas yun. <laughs> Diba? And sometimes we think, ah, I'm a Christian already, but we, we go through these superstitious practices and beliefs, agimat, and ting and ting, and sometimes we even make it Christianized. Okay? If I have opened Bibles in my home, maybe my home will be blessed. Even if we don't read it, even if we don't obey it. We have to be careful not to end up having not just false gods, but also worshiping the one true God our way. Instead of his way. And that's what God was also trying to address with Pharaoh. And that's what's keeping Pharaoh from from releasing the Israelites. Because he doesn't want the Israelites to worship the way they want it. That's why if you look at the story, we have here the story of uh, slaves. And, And if you will look at the story, you will probably think that the slaves here are Moses and the Israelites. But there's another kind of slavery here, and this is the kind of slavery that Pharaoh and the Egyptians probably have. They may think that they have it all on the outside. But internally, they are enslaved with wrong thinking, wrong beliefs, wrong mindsets, wrong traditions, and eventually belief in the wrong gods. So that's why if you look at the story here, hindi lang sa... 10 plagues account, but even as early as Exodus chapter 3 all the way to Exodus chapter 14, you will find that the recurring theme here is actually about Pharaoh's hardened heart. Okay, the hardening of the heart. So if we're going to summarize what this series is all about, and I'm sure it's been touched in some ways also in the previous weeks, the, the reminder for us today, even for Christians in 2023 here in Davao, okay, and uh, I'm glad that you're here in Davao because life is here. Tama ba? But I hope you will not just be glad that you're in Davao, but you will be glad in Victory Davao because you will find that it's not just life is here, but full, abundant life and the joy of everlasting life is preached here. Real life is here. Hindi lang yung foundation, but the real life that we have in Christ is here. And if there's one lesson that I would like for us to remember, especially as we look at the story, God over Pharaoh, and I hope we will all realize that the the lesson here is do not be like Pharaoh, who had a hardened heart. Let us not harden our hearts. Can you look at your seatmate and tell your seatmate, how's your heart lately? (laughs) Pag single yung katabi mo, and single ka rin, you can say it with a smile, how's your heart lately? Okay, but give a friendly reminder, please. Tell them, let us not harden our hearts. Let's look at this more in detail. And Exodus chapter 3, verse 19 tells us how God actually knew that Pharaoh will harden his heart. So before getting into the argument, did the Lord harden Pharaoh's heart because God told it, uh, foretold about it to Moses? That Pharaoh will harden his heart, or I will harden his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart many times. Before that, God already knew that Pharaoh will harden his heart. 
And the reason why the plagues continues all the way to the 10th plague that we're going to talk about today is because Pharaoh hardened his heart. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 19 to 20 says this, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So sometimes we look at sovereign ba si Lord or may free will ba si Pharaoh? Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And did Pharaoh harden his heart against God? And sometimes we pit that against each other. It's, it's God's sovereignty over man or man's will over God's sovereignty. In reality, God foreknew already ahead of time what's gonna happen. In fact, in Genesis alone, God already foretold that the Israelites will be enslaved in Egypt for 400 plus years. But God in His wisdom knew what's going to happen and He is sovereign in spite of whoever oppressive power that's out there. They're not ultimately in control. God is in control. And in the end, God's plan will succeed. In the end, no one can thwart His plans. God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And I hope that will give us comfort, especially if you have a relationship with God. But I think the flip side is also true. I hope it will instill a fear of God in us when we are not on His side. That's why do not harden your heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart by listening to the wrong crowd. Pharaoh hardened his heart because he was blinded by what the magicians and what his false gods could do. Pharaoh was blinded by his own traditions. He was blinded by his own pride and his own self-exaltation. Now, if you look at Pharaoh, and Hebrew is a book of names, you know, Pharaoh actually is a name that means a great house. And I'm sure many of us today, we're probably not like Pharaoh, but we want to build a great house. We want to have a great name. We, have, we want to have a great, you know, reputation. And we want to be, especially for our day and age, you know, we want pride in who we are and what we've accomplished. And sometimes we respond very violently when, we are, when our reputation, when our pride is being attacked. But when Pharaoh was confronted with the reality of who the Lord, who Yahweh, who the great I am really is, and signs and wonders never before seen in history and will never before seen ever again, he still could not respond well. So what happened? The great house ended up becoming not so great, which led to the downfall and the end of a once great civilization. And we can learn from the story of Pharaoh. by learning the lessons to keep us from having a hardened heart. I want to share with us some of these lessons, and I'm also preaching to myself as a reminder of uh, how all of us, look at your seatmate, okay? Look at your other seatmate. As great looking as we are. <laughs> how many you believe that the people here are great looking people? Wow, napapalakpak pa yung iba. Yes. Yes, but I feel like every now and then we need to be reminded that there's like a Pharaoh heart lurking in our hearts. And if we don't know how to deal with it, it might end up leading us in the wrong direction. So lesson number one, remember the God who is at work in your history. Remember the God who is at work in your history. If you can recall before Pharaoh even started doing bad things to the Israelites. Before Pharaoh even became oppressive and unjust towards the Israelites, what happened here is that in the beginning of Exodus, it tells us that now in chapter 1, verse 18, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Nakalimutan nitong Pharaoh, sino ba si Joseph? Hindi niya alam for some reason. Maybe the previous generation did not tell him Maybe the previous Pharaoh forgot to teach him. And that's why it's important for us to reach out to the next generation. Think generations, plugging. Okay, that's why we do kids' church. That's why we do ENC. 
Because what happened here is that if you really go back to history before Exodus in Genesis, we find here the story of how God used Joseph, an Israelite slave, sold as a slave, Hebrew, hindi wala pa palang Israel doon, okay? Hebrew slave, sold by his brothers, who had the gift of interpreting dreams. And Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret, not even the magicians could interpret. And the dream was there's going to be seven years of plenty, tulad ng uh, harvest there, and then seven years of famine, thin cows eating the fat cows. And when he interpreted that there's going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, so Pharaoh said, none have the wisdom of the gods like you and your God, so can you please tell us what to do? It was Joseph who advised them. Let's save up so that when famine comes, we will be sustained. And in fact, that's what made Egypt great. Because when famine came, only Egypt had food. And all the nations were going to Egypt. And all the people were going to Egypt for food, to buy food. And when they had no more money, they sold their lands. And then the Egyptians said, okay, you can continue to work on your land. Here's some seeds that you can use to plant. But you would share the crops with Egypt. Because you owe the land to Egypt. Joseph was a blessing to Egypt. Hebrews, as a whole, became a blessing to Egypt. But a pharaoh rose up forgetting the history. The God who intervened in their history. And when you think about Moses, Moses is a very interesting character. Moses, uh, of course, we know Moses is born as a Hebrew slave, raised as an Egyptian prince. And he graduated with a bachelor's of math and science, major in pyramid engineering, hieroglyphics, and Egyptian mythology from UE and UM, okay, University of Egypt, and then University of the Mediterranean. <laughs> he has postgraduate degrees on Egyptian mythology and, and mummification and everything else, being a privilege. But we know that he was drawn out of the water. That's what Moses meant. Drawn out of the water from the Nile. And the Pharaoh's daughter took care of him. But God called him out of a burning bush. And God had to remind Moses of his own history. Quite late in the game. 40 plus years old. So if you're getting to know the Lord at age 40 plus, you're still okay. But don't wait for you to be 80 before God can call you out. Just like Moses did. Look how God revealed himself to Moses. And he said, I am the God of your father. I don't know if you know who's the father of Moses. There's only two verses, I think, in scripture where the father's name was mentioned. And yung parents niya. We know the mother took care of him as a baby and nursed him. But God was trying to tell him, I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Joseph came up after Jacob, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And God was trying to bring Moses back to his history and trust that even though they've been slaves for 400 years in Egypt, there's a God of their history who is working his story today. And God's plan will surely come to pass because He's a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And because Moses knew, eventually knew who this God of history is, he started having a different heart. A different heart from the Egyptians and from the pharaohs of his day and time. That's why I would like for us to be reminded, remember the God who is at work in your history. At kahit na naging Christian tayo, whatever year you became a Christian, how, how young or how old you've been a Christian, I'm sure you can look back at your history and say, wow, God has been at work even before I became a Christian. 
God has been revealing himself to me. And God has been so good to me, sustaining me, even if I don't yet know him. Even if I haven't experienced him in a personal, in a powerful way. But God did not allow our hearts to be hardened more and more. But we've learned to recognize that God is there. And that's why we ended up becoming Christians. Next lesson. Recognize that the Lord, recognize that Yahweh, the great I am, I am that I am, that's what capital L-O-R-D means, is the one true God, unrivaled in greatness and goodness. We have to recognize that He is the Lord, He is Yahweh, the great I am. And in contrast to the gods of Egypt, if you will look at the, the plagues there, it's an attack on the gods of Egypt. First plague, second plague, third plague, fourth plague, fifth plague, diba? and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten, the death of the firstborn, which we'll, we'll discuss in detail. Lachon is an attack on the gods of Egypt. And if you look at the gods of Egypt, they have their own specialty. There's a god of fertility, god of the Nile, god of the sun, gods and goddesses, and they're competing with each other. It's like uh, whoever has more worshippers is stronger. And if, if these gods end up losing worshippers, they become weaker. And if you watch the movie, Gods of Egypt, you know, people are just um, pawns to whatever happens among the gods. And in contrast to the one true God, walang kanyang-kanyang specialization. You know, there's just the great I am. I am that I am. I will be that I will be. You want life, you go to the one true God. You want fertility, you go to the one true God. You want protection, you go to the one true God. You want healing, you go to the one true God. And these gods and goddesses that Egypt have are no match to the one true God. And he's not just great in power, he is unrivaled in goodness. He can show distinction between who are his enemies and who are his people. And Pastor Job had preached about that last week. Can you imagine? My flies dito, dito wala. May light dito, dito, you know, darkness dito, dito wala. Can you imagine? I was just thinking about, you know, what if I live in the border? You know, my flies here and then dito wala. <laughs> darkness here, light dito. And it's just really giving a picture to Pharaoh and to Egyptians to pick whose side you want to be in. Still giving him a chance. Every plague that happens. In fact, if you look at that, you can see that even in the plagues, the mercy of God is being revealed. It starts with just distressing things. But Pharaoh would not humble himself. Then it becomes more painful and costly. But still, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then it became disastrous and catastrophic until it reaches the 10th plague. And if we don't want to have a hardened heart, recognize that the Lord is the one true God. For Pharaoh, I was just really thinking about this. Now, how could Pharaoh miss this? Moses turned the Nile to blood. Here's what the Egyptians said. We can do that too. Here's more water. Here's more blood. Okay. Kung powerful yun, why not turn the blood back to water? Second plague, more frogs. You know what the magicians did? Let's make more frogs. If I was Pharaoh, why are you adding to the problem? And when he was asked, you tell me where you, when you want the frogs to disappear. You know what Pharaoh's response? Tomorrow. Isn't that our response at times? God is convicting us of something and we don't want to repent today. We just want to say tomorrow. That's when, when God removes the consequence, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Because we are getting used to rejecting God's voice, rejecting God's word, rejecting God's will. Until umabot na dun sa sukdulan. After this, Pharaoh will let you go. So how does this keep us from having a hardened heart? Another lesson, realize with humility that you are not the Lord. And it is futile to go against God himself. Can you say that with me? Realize with humility 
that you are not the Lord. It is futile to go against God himself. And I'm just surprised with how Pharaoh could not get this. All the gods. In fact, there was a time that the magician said, this is the finger of God. We cannot do this anymore. Pharaoh still hardened his heart. There was a time that Pharaoh acknowledged, please pray to the Lord for me. Plead to the Lord for me. But he would still not surrender his, his heart to the Lord and his lordship. Kaya umabot sa 10th plague eh, because Pharaoh believed his God. Pharaoh wanted to be God. Pharaoh wanted to take charge. Look at what happened here in chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. Look at God's heart here in the midst of the judgment. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. So this, this Pharaoh was oppressive. In fact, so oppressive, he was killing Hebrew babies. Can you imagine? Oh, ganong merciful si Lord. Judge mo na lahat ng gods mo para ma-realize mo. Pero ayaw mo pa rin mag-humble? O oh, sige, talagang prideful ka. Let's deal with your pride then. If you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land and they shall eat what is left to you after the hail and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field and they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. In other words, never before seen would happen things. And it's in verse 12 that we read a while ago. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and it in judgment the Lord. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. Because in the end, there's no other God except the Lord, the one true God. Paulit ulit in, in Exodus, you'll find that phrase, I am the Lord. That they may know that I am the Lord. I am the great I am. I am Yahweh. That they may know that I am the Lord. And sabi niya sa Israelites, your God. I don't know if the Israelites are starting to think like Egyptians and not just walk like Egyptians. If you've been a slave for 400 plus years, that means your parents were slaves, your lolo were slaves, the lolo ng lolo ng lolo ng lolo ng lolo ng lolo mo, slaves. You'll probably end up thinking, where's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You might be thinking, if, if our God is nowhere to be found, they worship na lang tayo ng Egyptian gods, baka i-bless pa tayo ni Pharaoh. And we know from the story that later on, though God rescued them out of Egypt, it could never take Egypt in their hearts. So the issue here is not just for the Egyptians and Pharaoh, but also for the Israelites who may have kept Egypt in their hearts. You know, we looked at Pharaoh's name, great house, did not become great. We looked at Moses, drawn out. Thank God he was drawn out of the water, but God was drawing him out of Egypt. And God is calling him to lead his people out of Egypt. Maybe one of the reasons why it's called the book of names because God was revealing His name to His people. I am the Lord. I am that I am. The great I am. There's no other God but Him alone. So realize with humility that Yahweh, the Lord, is the great I am. Lastly, respond to his lordship and receive his grace and mercy by faith. Can you say that with me? Respond to his lordship and receive his grace and mercy by faith. In the verse that we read a while ago, 
Exodus 12, verse 21 to 28. If we continue in the passage, it says there, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. So my final judgment, the killing of the firstborn, how can that be God's mercy and grace? Remember what the Egyptians did. They killed Hebrew boys. Ito yung warning ni Lord. Firstborn nga lang mamamatay eh. And my way out pa, if there is a Passover lamb, you take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And where children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went in and did so. The Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So even in the judgment, hindi lang may warning, but there's also a way out. If you get this sacrificial lamb, of course there's a qualification without blemish. Get a hyssop, which is actually connected to cleansing. Put this on the doorpost. When the angel of death comes, it doesn't matter whoever is inside this house. The angel of death will pass over. That's why it's called the Passover feast. And it is a reminder that they are to celebrate every year. And when they do that as a family, they have to be reminded of that. That instead of our firstborn getting killed, thank God that there's a Passover lamb that was killed instead. That in spite of God's judgment, we can experience His grace and His mercy. Let's continue. It says here in the following verse, verse 29 to 30. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And in verse 30, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. You know why God did this? Because Pharaoh started something, an oppressive, unjust way of dealing people. He was blessed to be king and pharaoh, but he forgot what the blessing is for. For him to be a blessing to the nations. Just like when Joseph interpreted the dream. And though it's not an Egyptian practice, he ended up killing babies. And then in killing them babies, throwing the babies to the Nile. And for those who worship that there's gods and goddesses of the Nile, they might think that that's the way to worship God. And God didn't want nations to kill babies because men and women, boys and girls were created in the image and likeness of God. Kaya pala ayaw din ni Lord na gumawa pa tayo ng image and likeness, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth, a God that we could worship. Kasi may ginawa na si Lord in His image and likeness. That's human beings. That's us to represent Him to the world. Not gods made of wood and stone. Minsan mukang, mukang frog, minsan mukang animal, diba? minsan half frog, half man. And, and we worship these gods. And when we worship these gods, we will end up becoming like them. Eyes, but they can't see. Ears, but they can't hear. Mouth, but they can't speak. Hands and feet, but they can't move. In fact, when there's a fire or when there's catastrophe, tayo pa yung save sa mga false gods na to instead of this God saving us. And if we could not give that up, we might end up becoming just like the gods that we worship, judged by the one true God. 
But thank God, He doesn't want us to end that way. He keeps on revealing Himself to us. I am the Lord, the one true God. In fact, if you look at Moses, bakit kaya may ordinances na keep this to be reminded because Moses was looking into something for all of us, not just for Israelites. If you look at Hebrews chapter, uh, bakit by grace through faith, Hebrews chapter 11, okay, it says there, verse 23 to 28, let's all read this together. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Next slide, please. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And he says there, by faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. So Moses, early on, realized, I need to pick sides. And then I realized he was a Hebrew, though, though they were still slaves. I think what the Egyptians are doing were not right. Of course, he did it his own way, ended up killing someone in the process, became a wanted man in Egypt, went to the wilderness. But in the wilderness, God revealed himself. I am that I am. I will be that I will be. If you trust me, I'm not just going to set you free from your guilt, shame, condemnation, but I'm going to use you to set my people free that they may worship me. And when he was doing this, refusing to be treated, there's a treasure, there's a reward he was looking forward to that these gods could not give him. And he was looking forward to the great deliverer. He wasn't the deliverer. He was just God's instrument. He learned how to humble himself. The so Bible says he's one of the hum most humble men on earth. <laughs> he learned how to become a servant of God. Now, the New Testament explained this even more. 1 Corinthians 5.7 says this, Paul was saying this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened for Christ. Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So Moses was pointing to someone greater than him. He was pointing to Yahweh the Lord, the great I am, but he was also pointing to another one, a great deliverer, Jesus, Yeshua, whose name means the Lord saves, that every family, every generation can look to. He's not just the God of the Old Testament, a God, the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us to reveal to us what kind of a God He is. In the first plague, Nile turned to blood, leading to the death of life and sustenance. When Yahweh came here on earth, the Lord saves. He turned water to wine, a celebration of life. In the Old Testament, in the last plague, there was the killing of the firstborn. For those who did not trust in the Lamb. In the New Testament, Jesus became the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And God's one and only Son was willing to to be crucified on the cross and experience death so that we who put our trust in Him can be saved. And just like the Passover meal, the question being given to the family whenever they celebrate that is, on whose side are you? All throughout Egypt, there was wailing. But in homes where there's the blood, there's just sober gratitude for God's saving grace. Remember Exodus in Hebrew is a book of names. It started with these are the names who came to Egypt that became slaves. You know, the last verse in Exodus tells us of how it was the Lord actually leading them out. It wasn't really about Moses. It was really about the Lord. The question is, whose name are you trusting? Who is your God? 
Is it the God of the Bible, the one true God, or is it something else? Whose side are you on? Are you on the world's side, on Pharaoh's side, on the Egyptian side, or are you on the side of the Lord and God's people? I believe now is the day of salvation. If God is speaking to you today and you are on the wrong side, do not harden your heart. Receive the grace and the mercy given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Kung merong three days of darkness on the ninth plague, Jesus went through three hours of darkness on the cross before he died. But on the third day, he rose again from the dead to prove to us that indeed the Lord saves. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for who you are. We thank you, God, that you desire that each and every one of us will take the road out of our own slavery, our own bondage, especially to our wrong beliefs, especially to our worship of the false gods in our day and age. So God, we humbly ask you today that you would give us the grace to humble ourselves before you, to recognize that we are not gods and recognize that you are the one true God that we can all look to, a God that is so great that we can fully depend on you, a God who is so good that we should trust no one else but you and you alone. A God who cared enough so much that you came to be like one of us and died in the worst possible way so that the worst of us can receive grace and mercy so that we, the enemies of God, can become sons and daughters of the living God. And with every head bowed down, every eye closed, I just want to pray. If you're here today, you've never really surrendered your life to the Lord yet. And you're saying, God, no more running away from you. No more rebelling against you. I want to surrender my all to you today. Would you be the Lord of my life? I want to be able to declare that you are the Lord, my God. If that's you, I want, I want you to just lift up your hands in, so that I know who's praying this. Taas po ng kamay, I want to pray for you. Yes, God bless you, bro. God bless you, sis. You know, this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. And the Bible says, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. And if you are raising your hands, can I ask you, can I invite you to please stand, please? Yes, go ahead and stand. Yes. You don't have to be ashamed of God. He's not ashamed of you. Okay, and I want to invite if you have some small group leaders to please come and stand with these people and pray for them. I want to lead you in prayer, okay? Those you, uh, and even if you did not raise your hand, but if you feel like, I want to pray that too, okay? It's never too late. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up. If God is tugging your heart right now, okay? I want to lead you in prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer with me with all sincerity and say, Lord God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I am not good enough to earn my way to heaven and I will never be good enough to repay you for all the sins that I've done. And I'm not strong enough nor good enough to be the Lord of my own life. So today, I make a decision to turn away from the false gods that I've been following and serving, to turn away from my sins and rebelling against you and I'm turning my life over to you everything in me is yours the good and the bad I ask for your forgiveness for the pride of what I've done and what I've accomplished and I turn to you for forgiveness for all the sins that I've committed in rebellion against you I surrender to you my broken parts my unclean parts that you may make me whole, that you may cleanse me and make me new. I invite you in the throne of my heart. Be my Lord, my Master, my God from now on and be my Savior. Thank you, God, that you gave a promise that whoever believes in you, whoever receives you, 
you will give us the right to become a child of God. So today, I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive the gift of eternal life. And I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may know you more. And that I may obey you and follow you more from this day forward. I surrender my whole life to you. I love you, my God, my Lord who saves, with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alakpangan naman natin si Lord sa mga nag-pray. I want to encourage you. This is one of the best decisions you could ever make. And this is not the end, but the start of an exciting journey to greater freedom and greater fulfillment in your life. I want to turn this over to Pastor Jopet. Thank you, Pastor Can we all stand up, everyone? I just want to, I want us to continue to pray. I just feel like there are some of us just like Pharaoh. We're in church, yet our hearts are still hardened. Maybe the very, there are things that you're still battling with the Lord. Lord, am I really going to surrender? There are things that you feel okay about. And Pharaoh, what really hindered him are the things that he was seeing in front of him. There's the magicians, there's this culture that he's accustomed to. And there's also this sex self-exaltation and being self-sufficient. I'm okay. But I want us to understand that the Lord our God, He's the one who is the one true God and the one who invites us and calls us to worship Him. Now what I will want us to really do right now is to, re- to recognize who He is in our lives, that He is the Lord. If you made that decision earlier to surrender your life to the Lord, you made the most important and the best decision you could ever make. But it does not stop there. But even for some of us who had already been in church for years already, yet we have felt like our, our walk with the Lord have, uh, uh, have stagnated. And maybe it's because of certain things that we have allowed to really consume our hearts. But I want us today to recognize the Lord for who He is. And more than just that, let us respond to His Lordship. I want us to right now in your own words, in your own lips, bow your heads in prayer. And I want you to utter a word of prayer recognizing and declaring the Lord for who He is, how mighty He is, that He is the one true God, and He is calling you today. And I want you to open your mouths, I want you to open your lips today, and by faith, just tell the Lord, God, You are the Lord of my life. Jesus, You are the one true God. I commit and I surrender my life to You. Come on, in the next few seconds, just utter these words of prayer. Lord, we just declare in our hearts, in our lives, yet even as a church, Lord, in this place, we declare that you are mighty, that you are worthy, that you are holy. Lord, that nothing and no one compares to your glory. So, Lord, in our hearts today, we declare that you are the Lord. Can we all lift up our hands to the Lord? Lord, as we lift up our hands, we declare that you are God. Lord, that all of our lives, we commit to you that everything of who we are, we declare, God, that you are worthy. And if there are things in our lives that we haven't laid it before you, if there are things in our lives that we haven't surrendered to you, Lord, we pray that you will be enthroned in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, that nothing else, that no one else would ever feel this place in our hearts and in our lives. So Lord, be enthroned. Lord, you are the Lord. You are the King of our lives. Can you declare it with me? Jesus, you are King. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, be enthroned in our lives. Let's worship the Lord together, church.
encourage all of us if like within the week there are still things that the Lord speaks to you maybe not today but as you journey understand that there is a road out from the very things that has enslaved us for the from the very things that has really captured us the Lord wants to set you free and if there are some of you that like throughout the whole week you're like I need help I need help in how I respond to things, whether it's in personal struggles of yours, in your marriage, know that there are people who can journey with you, who can pray for you, who can help you. And at the same time, we want to encourage you to journey with us. To those who made that decision earlier to give your life to the Lord, I pray that you would be connected with us. But at the same time, there are people who approached you earlier. They will ask for your numbers. The reason for that is they want to help you know God more. And so I pray for each one of us that we will continue to journey towards where God wants us to be. Amen? Amen? Can you tell the person beside you, the Lord is faithful in your life. As the Lord has been faithful to His people, He will continue to show how great He is and how good He is to all of us. Just before we close in prayer, to the students here, we'd like to invite you to join our Sunday. It's at the training room. It's going to be a great time together. Amen. Let's all lift up our hands to the Lord. Jesus, you are good and you are mighty in our lives. Thank you for purchasing us. Thank you, Lord, for giving your life for each one of us, and I pray that may we respond by faith, God, by giving our lives to you, giving our everything to you. Thank you for this beautiful moment together that you have given to us to worship you 
And Lord, be transformed by your word. The Lord, even as we depart from this place, may we uh, do, may we live out the lives that you have given to us. And I pray that people will see around us, Lord, that we are the salt and light of the world. Lord, you have set us apart for your glory, for your purposes. Use us, we pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon each one of us. Lord, we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. Victory Dava, you are blessed and you are sent out. God bless you all. Sweet.